All right, we are live. Um, I'm super excited to have this chat. We are going to be talking about professional athlete wealth management with two pros. I've got two NCAA former D1 athletes, um, Sean Menichella, um and Justin Heller. Um, Sean, I know your background is in baseball. You work with several MLB players right now. I wanted to kick off with you, and if you could just give a little bit about your backstory, your journey from that, you know, I know you played elite baseball growing up, college, now you work with several of these players. Could you talk a little bit about how you fell into this, this niche? Yeah, absolutely. I think... You know, I was a lot of the opportunity to play with a lot, um, you know, a lot of great athletes. You know, I wasn't able to make it to the big leagues like some of my peers, but at the time, you know, we were playing in travel baseball. We were fortunate enough to win some national championships. Um, my father was actually in this industry and working with professional athletes for about 10 years or so. And, you know, we were able to, you know, work with, some of those athletes that made it um, to the big leagues. Um, I had went off to school, played four years at Iona, graduated, got my, uh, you know, my feet wet in the industry, and then came to join Beacon. And because of the relationships I had on the baseball side, I was able to kind of navigate some of those showcase circuits on the amateur side and, and make some introductions. And, you know, it's just a, a nice transition. I think the biggest thing was obviously having some background in the sport was helpful and identifying some talent that I thought would you know, have the opportunity to play at that level and offer the services that, you know, we, we use for our clients. But yeah, I mean, I think it was just kind of a, uh, a great way for me to stay involved in the game, um, working with some of my peers as well as the younger generation of baseball players and sharing some of my experience. And Justin, um, you were in the Sweet 16, what, about a decade ago? Wow. That's right. <laughs> so uh, a year ago, you launched your own RIA, Heller Private Wealth. Talk, talk about that journey. What took you from there to, to where you are now? Yes, definitely. So similar to Sean, um, played basketball my whole life. I, I ended up going to the University of Miami, where I walked onto the basketball team and I've had a few good years, the Canes, uh, recently, but up, up until that point, it wasn't really known for their basketball. And so I was fortunate enough to be there when we won the ACC. We went to the NCAA tournament, Sweet 16. Um, and I knew I wasn't going to be going to the next level. Um, <laughs> so I had already started to think, how can I keep my love for sports and basketball and also combine that with one of my passions being finance. So um, I got out of school, I got my MBA, got started at one of the big banks. And um, actually my first two clients were guys from those teams that went on to play professionally. So right out of the gate, I was already in the sports version of wealth management. Um, definitely expanded it from there. It's about half of what we do now, but I thought Sean made some good points, just actually knowing the game and playing the game at a high level. Most financial advisors, I don't think, are able to actually talk to their client after a game and, and know truly what just went on and yeah. where the coach maybe slipped up or this guy might have made a, made a bad play. I think that does give us an advantage and really helps build the relationship on and off the court. Well, and, and, and the relationship's huge, um, and and both of you touched on this. I mean, Sean, when you were talking about your story, it sounds like it was really built on a lot of those relationships you built, playing elite baseball, growing up, going to college. You know, now you know, um, you know, doing amazing work in Greater Philadelphia, and and you're representing a national client base. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how relationships have helped you build your business? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, in the beginning, I remember the first, the first couple of years of trying to build my professional athlete business, you know, I had some contacts, but you know, it's a lot of trial and error, right? It's, it's going to these showcase tournaments. It's, 
really not knowing where to navigate at first. I mean, knowing a little bit enough to feel like, um, feel at least a comfort level, but introducing yourself to, you know, some of the prospects, parents or players, you know, getting involved with the different agencies, um, you know, introducing yourself to you know, different CPAs or attorneys that have worked with professional athletes and, and all of and just sharing what we've done for some of our clients. Um, and then obviously the relationship with the players and the family, right? So which it's such a, a tight knit relationship because you you start working with these men since you young age. You know, they're 18, so in some cases 17 years old. Um, don't have the life experiences to understand really kind of what you're talking about. Um, and it's, it's overcoming that, that trust concern as to, you know, hey, why should I trust you with, with my money? What experience do you have? And then, you know, for a lot of my guys, I kind of play a wealth manager as well as in some cases, big brother, um, father figure, all of those things. And then you know, become an advisor to the family, not just the player. So, you know, there's relationships are huge, whether it's contacts that can get you introduced to some of these players or navigating the scene, but also the relationship with the player and the family. And, you know, you get to watch them you know, succeed in, in sports struggle in their profession, um, start families, you know, build houses, start businesses, all these things, and you get to kind of come along for the ride. And my, you know, my clients are, you know, very active with me before they make decisions, they reach out and call me because they trust the guidance that we provide. So, you know, it's a very fulfilling type of experience. Mm -hmm. and, and Justin, how about your experience with, with networking and building relationships? How has that played into your practice? I mean, it's it's all relationships. So, uh, like Sean mentioned, whether it's the relationships with the actual player and their family, or the other professionals in their lives, maybe their agent, or if they already have an attorney or CPA that's already um, part of the team, just meshing well with them. But it's all about the relationships, and I think that doing the right thing early and often and all the time um, eventually they start to trust you and then not every single conversation has to be a full uh, explanation and full proposal. We can kind of understand that our interests are aligned. I want them to save money and be smart with their money. Um, most other people coming into the picture want them to spend money in some way, shape or form. So we're working towards the same thing. We want you to save your money, um, make good decisions and and eventually the relationship, like Sean said, I mean, it's way more than just a, a client advisor. I feel silly sometimes saying this is my client. They're my best friends, um, we're family and, and being financial advisor and client almost, you forget that it, that's even how it really started. And, and I think that's a good pivot because I, I wanted to talk about the opportunities and some of the big pain points that professional athletes deal with. You know, I, a lot of lay people, you know, who, who are sports fans, maybe not sports fans, they look at these guys getting big contracts, big money, they think, all right, they're rich, they have no problems in the world. They, these are humans, just like everybody else. Um, these are highly taxed humans <laughs> um, who give a lot back to Uncle Sam. Um, so, you know, I, I and, and these are also people whose career spans, their high earning spans tend to be much earlier in their careers than most working professionals whose high earning years are typically later in their careers. Can you guys talk about those dynamics? And Justin, I want to go back to you for this. Talk to me about, I mean, NBA, you've got some of these players are getting big contracts at 19, 20 years old. Um, can you talk about how you work with them and guide them and help them through some of the natural points they're going to deal with getting that lump of money at that age? Yeah, I think that um, that's got to be the biggest pain point, in my opinion. Um, like you mentioned, so we... We were all that age. I mean, 
definitely challenging to think about your future if you just came into many, many millions at 19, 20 years old. Um, so I just think, look, we, we try to begin with the end in mind. We try to put that long-term vision in front of them and take steps each day, each year to get there. And a lot of that is resisting temptation, um, especially with the NBA locker room. I mean, you can be, you can have a guy in there making a minimum, call it $1.8 million, and a guy in there making $50 million. Um, and it's only a group of 12, 15 guys. So they talk about what they're up to. It's not a football locker room where you might not even know a guy on your team. You know what cars they're driving, what vacations they're taking all the fun temptation there is out there. Um, so I think that the biggest pain point is just trying to remind these guys that this is just a, an entire career's worth of earnings. Somebody might work 40, 50 years to make this money if they're lucky and you're getting it in five years. So now maybe you're done playing at 35, you're gonna live till 95, 100. Um, that's a lot of years to make that money last. And so we got to try to resist some of the temptation um, when, when we're young and easier said than done. But um, from my experience, I think just really getting that budget set and and sticking to it is is the key. But again, easier said than done. Well, and, and, and Justin, I mean, how, how, how do you go about building that budget? I mean, there, there's got to be some tough back and forths going on <laughs> to, to get that in place. Yeah, it's definitely tough. Um, I think firstly is uh, the cost of living. So I've gone through the experience of guys living in, um, you know, Salt Lake City, Utah, where you can get pretty far with $5,000. Um, and then you got LA or, or New York, um, even Miami starting to get crazy down here. So I think first is understanding the circumstances of where they are. And that's where being that close and, and having that relationship, like Sean and I mentioned, being realistic, you can't be, um, you know, the advisor that's totally out of touch. And every time they spend a dollar, you're questioning it. You have to give them some room. You have to be understanding of the cost of living and the circumstances. But again, it's, it's uh, very hands-on and just reminding them, look, if you want to be here when you're 50, like you said you did, then we got to cut back here while you're 22, 23 years old. So um, I don't think setting the budget is the hardest part from my experience. I think it's sticking to it and staying accountable and revisiting it because um, it's, it's tough. And, and Sean, you, you know, working with MLB players, you're, you're in a little bit of a different boat. Um, you know, some of these kids, you know, they go through our minors arbitration. So they're a little bit grown, but, but when they get that bag, um, how, how do you work with them when they're building up to that? I mean, what, what do you put in place to, to make sure when they do get that bag, that there's a plan in place to, you know, prepare for their future? Yeah, I think with, with, MLB guys, right, if you're talking about high school kids or even college kids that are, you know, signed, you know, the, the pay structure is much different, right? So it's a signing bonus up front, depending on the slot value and where you're drafted. And then, you know, it's minor league salary. Um, and that could be a couple of years, right? And then if you get called up, you're talking about major league minimum, you're under team control arbitration eligible in three years. Um, so a lot of variables to consider, right? It's not as much as, hey, this is our rookie deal and we know how to, um, you know, we, we make it another contract. Hopefully we're gonna prepare that this is the last one just in case and I'm sure Justin and his team you know, does that. Um, but it's different. I think for us, it's, it's uh, really focusing on building the foundation introducing strong financial principles at a young age, right? These kids are 18, 19, they don't have the life experience to truly understand what that money means. You know, even if, even if it's a signing bonus of $2.5 million, right? That's still a lot of money for a young kid to make. Um, 
and you know a lot of times it's going back to cash flow to subsidize the paycheck throughout the miners because they don't get paid very much so how much of that signing bonus needs to be used to subsidize their lifestyle you know along the way and up until maybe they get the call up but it's certainly different um the good news is that hopefully by the time they've gotten to arbitration or free agency we've had our hands on them for you know quite some time to instill some of these principles and foundations so that they're buying into the process to you know that they've they've got some life experience behind them to to truly understand how to apply some of those principles right um you know i prepare all of my guys for what it could potentially look like at the elite level um, but I also have to protect on the back end that they don't make it, right? So in the event that we, ne- we maybe get a cup of coffee in the big leagues, but we don't necessarily stay there, we want to make sure that there's enough to propel the next phase of their career or the next thing that they're going to be successful at. So certainly a, a, there's a lot of similarities, but some differences and variables to consider um, our risk tolerance for a typical 18 year old, right? Who's made, who has $2 million invested. If they're working for the next, you know, 50, you know, 40 years, that risk tolerance could be pretty aggressive, but these guys have so many variables that risk tolerance needs to be more conservative on a moderate you know, level because we can't afford to be able to, to take that much risk. We can't have, you know, 30% years down in the market. And the next thing you know, they're released from their team or tear their ACL and, and their career's over. So it's it's a unique um, investment interaction. There's some differences, but there are certainly a lot of similarities between MLB guys and NBA guys too. Mm-hmm. Well, and Sean, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the variables. I mean, you, you, you guys are, are in niches where you've got a lot of guaranteed contracts. Mm-hmm. When you look at other athletes, I'll bring up NFL. Um, guaranteed contracts are not the norm. Mm-hmm. We're starting to see some, and you know they're they're making a little progress there, but not a lot of them. I mean, for yeah. some of these guys, that last paycheck could literally be the last paycheck. Right. Um, and, and I'll open this up to either of you. Did you want to jump on and talk a little bit about? the nuances you know in those circumstances where we're looking at a sport where it's not a guaranteed contract and and the challenges that could that could present i'll let you go justin sure um i mean i have worked with some nfl guys and it's it's totally different i think us being primarily nba and, and mlb guys here um you forget what a difference it is because I mean, you see this number and even week to week, this paycheck coming in and then all of a sudden one injury, like you mentioned, Brian, and and it could be the last one. So um, one thing that Sean brought up kind of ties into this that I wanted to mention is just sometimes um, separating that relationship from what's uh what's at stake here a little bit because these become our our friends and our family and they think like a lot of times you know i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna get the next one i'm gonna i'm I'm just as good as i was the year before and we might feel that same way on a personal level but from a financial planning standpoint we always have to plan worst case scenario so um like sean mentioned for the guaranteed contracts I like to plan that this is, we got to say this could be your last contract, even if we really know there's no way, it doesn't matter. We got to, we got to look at it that way. And then from a non-guaranteed standpoint, we got to only take the small portion that is guaranteed and um, the rest is is kind of icing on top. So total game changer um, being in football, I think versus baseball and basketball right now, I, I think, like you said, it's changing, but in my opinion, gotta gotta just take what what the facts are, regardless of emotionally how you feel and and what you think about their skill level and the position they're in. Um, the guaranteed money is the guaranteed money, so gotta just just plan with that. Yeah, I think Justin is a good point. I mean, I think with the NFL guys, it's certainly a lot more to consider. I mean, we've managed some NFL guys in the past too, and the um, 
you know, when we're running our future value projections, you might have you know 10 more scenarios present there because of the different incentives or um, you know the way that those deals are structured. Um, I loved what you talked about too in terms of like the um, the tough conversations, right? These are professional athletes, the highest level of uh, you know af af athletes, and it's sometimes difficult to talk to them about what you know. We don't like talking about failure, but it's our job to be the advisor. And sometimes it is difficult to um, because you have such a close personal relationship to tell them what they need to hear, um, especially if they you know once they progress and they're a little bit more. Um, you know, they have a little bit more stay in, in, in their respective leagues. A lot of times you have to have tough conversations and, and tell them, hey, like if we continue to spend like this, we can put you know certain things at risk, right? We have to make this money last. So, you know, a lot of my guys like the fact that, you know, I'm gonna sometimes have to tell them things that maybe they don't want to hear, but they need to hear. Right. I'm not your dad, I'm not gonna tell you what you can spend on, but I will tell you that if we're spending past a certain point, there's going to be you know, a, a cause and effect to that type of spending. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, we, they, they trust us to tell them, you know, what's, what they need to hear. And sometimes I think they want us to tell them that in some cases, they want someone to say no, because they know that we're looking out for them. We're not just the yes man telling them they could do whatever they want, that we have their interest in, in mind. So I want to talk about some big stories and i mean there's a lot of moving parts going on in the sports world right now um but i want to kick that off giving a, a big congratulations to shohei otani uh who just announced he got married i don't know when 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 he put the ring on it but but it, it <laughs> he announced it today so um i want to give a shout out to him he's having a big few months yeah. Um, just got married um, a few months ago. He just signed, I, I believe, a record MLB contract, $700 million guaranteed. Um, but a lot of the news stories and, and analysis we saw about that contract wasn't even just the mega size of it. It was the deferred strategy that he put in place with this that has you know, tech startups and everybody else looking at it um, in awe. Um, Sean, I wanted to kick that over to you. This Otani contract is very irregular. Um, what do you like about it? What do you hate about it? Talk, talk to me about it. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, congratulations to, to, to show. Hey, I mean, obviously getting married is huge, huge. Um, accomplishment and you know there's certainly some wealth management concerns to, to talk about on that level right from an asset protection standpoint the state planning standpoint but I mean in terms of the contract um, I mean we have we've never seen anything like from the size and stature of it the way in which it's structured um, I think it's great for baseball I think it's great for um, fans because it will probably allow more players to you know be paid and, and probably more success for that franchise um you know my first thought when i look at it as a financial advisor is the fact that it's you know deferred it's on the back end and the and time value of money associated with that um, if that money was spread across evenly you know over that 20-year period and invested um, the compounding interest would be substantially more. Now, that probably, I don't know the, the details of what into the, went into the negotiation, but, you know, just I ran some numbers today, you know, just because I thought we might talk about this. And, you know, if you were to take the total amount that was paid and you were to invest it and had a 6% average annual return, the difference between the current structure of the of the deal versus if you were to be paid thirty five billion across the last twenty years is almost a difference of a hundred million, right? So, and it's pretty substantial. Now, the likelihood is is that he may have not gotten that much in the deal if he didn't defer it. So, um, but I think we're probably trending more in that direction as teams are looking to um, you know add more talent, pay more players, salary caps. 
you know, in other sports are, are, are rising. Baseball doesn't have one, but you know, you're seeing more super teams, you know, become more more present and you know, this preferred contract structure is allowing them to navigate um, some of those deals and pay more guys. So I think it's great for the game. It's obviously great for Shohei. I think it would have been a little bit better if he would have been able to have it more evenly spread across, but you know, I'm not sure as to like what the thought process was, but I think it's going to be fine as long as you know, he's, uh, you know, practicing some sound financial principles, but it would be pretty hard to mess that one up. Yeah. Well, and, and Justin, I mean, when you look at a deal like that and a contract like that and all the nuances, I mean, what's your takeaway? So I originally, um, when I saw kind of all the nuances that started to get released, I thought similar to Sean, because, you know, us uh, wealth managers, time value money, most people don't think about that. And that's the first thing we think about. So I was originally looking the same way at, okay, what's, what's the catch here? And why is it not actually as good as people think? Um, but just to take the opposite side and take it at a sur at surface level, surface value, I think what everyone was so intrigued about is the deferral and from a state tax standpoint, how that was going to save him however many millions and millions of dollars. Um, and I do think that that is really becoming part of the conversation now, um, especially in the basketball world. I mean, you have franchises in San Francisco, California, you know, New York City, New York, and then you have Houston, Texas, and Miami, Florida, Orlando, Florida, where there's no state taxes. Um, so with the size of these contracts um, and the, the drastic difference, um, you know, upwards 10% in, in state taxes, higher in certain states, I mean, we're, we're talking tens of millions of dollars. And in this situation, a $700 million contract, I haven't done the math, but it, it sounds like hundreds of millions of dollars in this situation, potentially, um, if he was to get that money in a different state. So I think that um, that's what caught everyone's attention because we haven't seen anything structured that way. And it makes sense. Um, it's happening, especially in free agency, different contract negotiations. I think that the players and their teams have become more aware of what a million dollars in New York City looks like versus a million dollars in Houston, for example. So I think it's all great stuff. Um, again, we don't know all the nuances and, and what really went into it and why it ended up being drawn up that way. But like Sean said, I mean, <laughs> at the bare minimum, he, he should be okay with that kind of that <laughs> contract. And before we wrapped up, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about NIA. Um, you know, for folks listening who might not be familiar, that, that, that was the NCAA's rule came down from the Supreme Court that allowed college athletes to be able to profit from their name, image, and likeness, doing sponsored social media posts, promos, commercials, and so forth. Um, Justin, as far as NIL, um, how... How do you, do you see this as an opportunity for you to get the wealth management conversation started earlier in their careers before they get that big bag? Um, how, how are you navigating this new playing field with NCAA athletes? Yeah, it's definitely um, just pushes the conversation a lot earlier. Um, I think that it's great for the athletes. I think it's not so great for college sports because it's just mayhem right now. Um, but for the athletes, especially a lot of women's basketball players, I'm seeing maximizing their value, making money that they were not able to make. That's really exciting. Um, but I do think that it creates a lot of potential downfalls if the right teams are not in place for these athletes. I mean, now they're on their own to start filing taxes on potentially multi-million dollar contracts, um, have the right financial planning in place to make sure this money lasts if they don't make it to the next level. So I think it starts the conversation earlier. I think it makes it even harder. Now we're going a 
few years younger um, in, in life, trying to make mature, sound decisions. So while, while being on a college campus, um, not easy to do, but I think it's great. It gives a lot of people the ability to make money that they, they didn't have that, that option just a, a year or two ago. So got to get in there early and, and hope that um, you can have those conversations even earlier. And it's great for people like Sean and I to now have that intro a few years earlier. If they do go on to the next level, you hope to continue guiding them there. And if they don't, now it's that worst case scenario again, let's make this money last or, or create whatever life goals you have and, and use this money to help you get there. So overall, it's been, it's been great. Yeah. And, and Sean, you know, with, with MLB, you're accustomed to, to getting in touch with these guys before that big payday comes. But as far as NIL, do you see that as an extension of that process? Yeah, I think I've gotten a lot more questions about it at the amateur level. You know, you're meeting with 16 year old kids and it's, um, you know, they want to know what, what type of interaction you can have from an NIL standpoint. You know, a lot of the agencies are, are, are working hard in, in negotiating some of those contracts, but I agree with Justin. I think it's, it's a way to introduce some of those like sound principles, right? The, even, you know, the loop, the, the, the difference in, um, in pay for where college baseball players versus, um, you know, college basketball players is a little bit different. It's not as lucrative, but, you know, that's still something to say, all right, well, if we are getting maybe 50,000, if we take a certain percentage of that and just practice saving, you know, practice the principle of paying yourself first early on before we even get to, you know, the professional sports, I think that puts us ahead of the game. Um, and also, I think it, it enters in because, the NBA doesn't have this anymore. They used to where kids can enter out of high school, but it, it, it allows me the opportunity to say, all right, well, like what value do we put on a college education? You can still get paid something while you're going there through some of these deals. Uh, you might not have to, you know, sign as a third, fourth round pick. Maybe you can go to school and, and get a college education and, you know, still receive some level of compensation through these deals. So it's probably a different interaction for sure. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> I think that there's, you know, certainly some cleaning up to do um, on how and how it works with the different universities. But, um, you know, ultimately, I think it's good, man. I think about all the college, you know, football games and basketball games I've played and the college jersey sales and, you know, all the money that these players have made for these organizations. So, be able to share in some of those profits, I think, is ultimately a win. It's just uh, kind of tweaking it and correcting it to where it, you know, it works for everybody. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a great way to, to get them started early. Sean Medicella, Beacon Financial Services, Justin Heller, Heller Private Wealth. Thank you guys so much for joining. I uh, appreciate everybody who tuned in today. Uh, and guys, I, this was fun. Uh, we, we might have to do another one of these in a few months. So yeah. look forward to that. Sounds Thank good. You. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Thanks Justin. Thanks, Justin. See you, everyone. See you, Sean.